the Lord bless you. Beloved, I'm going to go into the word of the Lord, but one thing that I've realized this morning is that whenever God wants to use somebody, and whoever has a desire to be used by God greatly in the earth should understand that if God's going to get ready to use you, he's going to submit you to a school. God is going to submit you to a program. Why? Because he wants to configure grace on your life. But not only because he wants to configure grace on your life, but also because he wants to build your character and he wants to build capacity so that you might be able to handle the grace configuration that he wants to release over you. Apostle Martin Burke says the following word and he always says, he says that unless your character is prepared for your anointing, the anointing, the mental, the mantles are your platform. The mental will cause you to crash unless your character is prepared effectively for the anointing. And so in the preparation of character, there's always, in, uh, the included into that, there's always pain. God will always allow pain to be inflicted upon you, not because he wants to punish you, not because he wants to, um, he wants to cast you out, but because he wants to cut a couple of things out of us. He wants us to come to a place where we understand the importance of making room for him. Because just like the song just said now, that whatever is unclean, whatever is unrighteous, whatever is unjust, whether it be a character trait, whether it be a habit, whether it be a connection, whether it be an agreement, whether it be a contract, God cannot habitate that vessel in, uh, with those unclean things. So God will separate you. He will pull you from in order to pull you towards him. Amen. He does not pull you out in order to isolate you and so that you might become lonely, but he pulls you from so that he can pull you towards him, so that he can become, uh, so that he can be intertwined with you, so that he can become one with you. Because now, if there is anointing and there's grace, and there's not a pulling out of, what happens now is we will attempt to use what is in the world, and we want to mix it with the anointing. And anytime you want to mix unrighteousness with the grace of God, or you want to mix self with the grace of God, or you want to mix habits, or you want to you want to mix your own ways with the grace of God or the move of God in the earth, you will get a distorted move. You will get a move that is not pure and that cannot bring glory unto God. That is why God will pull you out of so that he can use you for him. You remember what, 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 what um, Yaku said to us or Jack said to us Sunday that God selected the people for, for him. And once they went into Egypt, what he did is he brought them out of Egypt. But now he was bringing them out of Egypt so that he can have them for himself. But once he brought them out of Egypt, he had a struggle with them to bring out Egypt out of them. He had a struggle because he wanted Egypt out of them. They were out of Egypt now. They were not under the oppression anymore. They were not battling to eat onions and carrots anymore. They were not toiling anymore, but they still had the mentality of slaves. They still responded to Moses as if they were slaves. They still responded to God as if they were slaves in Egypt. And as a result of their slave mentality, they were not eligible. To enter into the promised land. It is not that God could not take them into the promised land. But they did not qualify because of what they were holding on to. There were certain habits and behaviorisms that they were not willing to let go and separate themselves from. Uh, so that they can qualify for the promised land. And so today, beloveds, we are going to read from the book of Joshua chapter 7. You can stand for the reading of God's word. Their school was set for, was 40 years in the desert. 40 years they were roaming in the desert. And in that 40 years, God was trying to get Egypt out of them. God was trying to, to extend grace unto them in Eden so that he can cut out of them which could not enter the promised land. I see that I need a level unfatty, but our things that they had to let go so that they could enter prophetic fulfillment. Joshua chapter 7, and we will read from verse 7. To verse 12. As he did, can he say amen? Joshua said, Lord God, you brought our people across the Jordan. Why did you bring us this far and then allow the Amorites to destroy us? 
we should have been satisfied and stayed on the other side of the Jordan River. I promise my life, by my life, Lord, there is nothing I can say now. Israel has surrendered to the enemy. The Canaanites and all the other people in the country will hear about what happened. Then they will attack us and kill all of us. Then what will you do to protect your great name? The Lord said to Joshua in verse 10, Why are you down there with your face on the ground? Stand up. Israel or the Israelites sinned against me. They have broken the agreement that I commanded them to obey. They took some of the things that I commanded them to destroy. They have stolen from me. They have lied. They have taken those things for themselves. That is why the army of Israel turned and ran away from the fight. They did that because they have done wrong. They should be destroyed. I will not continue to help you or be with you unless you destroy everything I commanded you to destroy. Now go and make the people pure. Tell them, make yourselves pure. Prepare for tomorrow. The Lord, the God of Israel says that some people are keeping things that he commanded to be destroyed. You will never be able to defeat your enemies until you throw away those things. We skip to verse 20. I can answer, it is true, I sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I did. In Jericho, I saw a beautiful coat from Babylon. About five pounds of silver and, a, and, and about a pound of gold. I wanted these things for myself. I let my ooge please satisfy the lust of my eyes. So I took them. You will find them buried in the ground under my tent. The silver is under the coat. Look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, clean the camp. Beloved, that will be my title this morning as you take your seat. Clean the camp. Clean the camp. Beloved, in James chapter 1 verse 17, the, James writes and he says, Every good gift and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, who, in what whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. What the text refer to is that in God there is no change. God does not change. And though his approach from the Old Testament to the New Testament towards sinners has changed, his feelings and his opinion towards sin and unrighteousness did not change. What was sin in the days of Moses and in the days of Job and in the days of Malachi is still sin today. What was unrighteousness in the Old Testament and what God rejected then, he still rejects today. Holiness is still tight, but it will always remain right. You have to understand that under the law, under the law, they dealt with sin against God in a very direct and legalistic way. In other words, why it's the, if you sinned in the Old Testament, then you would either die, they would either take you to the gate of the city, depending on what sin you committed, and they will stone you to death. Or what they will do, deacons and demon, they will excommunicate you. They will cast you out of the city. God would command these people based on the sin that you have committed not to associate with you because they will excommunicate you on your sin. So this was a very legalistic and direct approach to get sin outside of the camp because God wanted to keep his nation and his people pure. Why? Because it is only from a place of purity that they could have communion with him. You remember that God does not descend on a sacrifice that ain't pure. He wants a blemishless lamb. A lamb sonna in a defects. This is why what they also had in the Old Testament as what a lamb sonna book. 
Maar die zonnebok needed to be clean. The, 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 the goat of sin needed to be pure. Because God could not connect himself with unrighteousness. Numbers 19 verse 20 says, But the man who is unclean and does not purify himself from uncleanness, that person shall be cut off from the midst of the assembly. Because he has defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water for impurity has not been sprinkled on him. He is unclean. And so what the sticks confirm is that if you fell in sin, there was a very legalistic approach. They would excommunicate you from the city. And even today, beloved, when we read the New Testament, the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 16, the Bible says that they that cause division in the house of God, we should separate ourselves from them. Paul says, Markele, wat verdeeld het vir oorsa. Merkele, en waski warn the saints to abstain from them. Beloved, you can go and read Leviticus 18, 29, Numbers 15, we don't have time to read that scriptures. Numbers 15, 30, and 1 Kings 22, 46. But there was still an opportunity for forgiveness in the Old Testament. Even though there was a very legalistic approach, God raised up his priests to come before him and, and, and sacrifice on behalf of the people. So he, he would still create an opportunity for them to be forgiven and to be restored. But the problem with this was the goats and the doves did not do the job. Because the people now had to make the sacrifice annually. And the problem is eaten if the sacrifice did not suffice. The people would not have forgiveness. If the smoke didn't go up straight. The people would not be forgiven. If the goat wasn't clean enough, the sacrifice would not be accepted. If the priest was not holy, the sacrifice would not be accepted. Why? Because if the priest would come into the presence of God in his unholy state, he would die there. Because of the approach of God towards sin in the Old Testament. We fast forward to the New Testament, and in the New Testament, we find that God now, in this covenant of grace, He has a more gracious approach towards sin. This does not mean that He has changed His opinion towards sin. It does not mean that He has changed His, his, his emotions around sin, but He has a more gracious approach towards sin. Because now, according to John 3, 16, he gave his only begotten son, Brother Craig, to die for us. And this son did not only come as a son, but he came as the perfect lamb. He came as a lamb that would die once and for all. And through this lamb, you now have a window of opportunity to obtain forgiveness. As he said, I'm going to you have a window of opportunity now to have forgiveness because the sacrifice on the hill of Calvary was for the remission of sins. Isaiah would say it this way. He says, like a lamb went to the slaughterhouse without opening his mouth. Jesus went to Calvary to die and he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. So God creates now a window of opportunity for forgiveness through his son on the, on the hill of Calvary. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And even though the only reason why God creates this window of opportunity is because he does not want us to become eligible or remain eligible for the wages of sin. He wants us to, to, he wants us to skip death, eternal death. He wants us to inherit eternal life. But remember, beloved, it says no, it's your opinion. It does not change how he feels concerning sin. Sin is still sin in the sight of God. Fornication is still fornication. Theft is still theft. Cheating is still cheating. Lying is still lying. Killing is still killing. It does not change his opinion. Concerning sin and unrighteousness, he remains steadfast as it relates. He's only changed his reproach. Approach. And so Paul asks in Romans 6, 1 verse 2, he says, So do you think we should continue sinning? 
Know that our window of opportunity is. Know that our, now that there is grace available, now that we can obtain forgiveness and we have access to everlasting, now Paul is stopping everything and he's asking, do you think we should still be sinning? Does this mean that we can continue living in sin and unrighteousness since God's approach is not so legalistic? Since he, he does not desire to excommunicate you, do you honestly think that you can continue with the thing that he is deeming to save you from? Do you think that you, you can continue and consistently and persistently after grace has been extended unto you, continue living a life that does not testify about the mercy and the grace and the love of God? I forgot, do you think we can still sin? He says, so that God will give us more and more grace? I say, of course not. Our old sinful life has ended. It's dead. So how can we continue to love in sin? So even under the covenant of grace, Yahweh still opposes unrighteousness just like he did in the Old Testament. Why? Because sin does not only separate you from God, but it places you under bondage and slavery. It opens the door for demonic possession. It opens the door for demonic influence. Bitty, I have discovered that many of the struggles that we have, it's not because we have struggles. It's because we don't want to let go of sin. Many of the things that we are dealing with. A struggle on crack the coop. Maak het hier probleem om wijn te koop nie. So nou dit moest hier financial problem nie. Heet ek a financial problem? Don't have a financial problem. Kan die petrol in die kar gooi nie, maar ek kan cigarettes koop. Heet ek a financial problem? Ek het hier financial problem nie. Ek het a sin problem. You get what I'm trying to say? I'm struggling, I'm struggling uh, uh, to pay the school fees at school, maar but I don't have a problem with going to the club on set Sunday evening, Saturday evening. So what is, what, what, what is my issue? My issue is not finances. My issue is sin. I have not yet confessed and separated myself from the thing that God has called me out of. And so now I am trying, uh, to, to, I'm trying uh, to convince myself that my issue is something else. When my issue is sin. Beloved, in our text today, the people of God has now crossed Jordan. Now, the river Jordan signifies, it signifies a boundary that you have crossed for transformation. So, they have come out of Egypt. Remember now, this is not the same people that came out of Egypt anyway. This is a new breed. This is a new people. This is not the people that came to the Red Sea. Because the people that came to the Red Sea died because of disobedience. But now God is bringing Joshua through the river Jordan. And the Jordan symbolizes baptism. Jordan symbolizes baptism for those people because now they are transformed and they should be able to go into the, the promised land as this transformed people. This baptized and renewed people. Transformation not only outwardly because they are a new generation under the age of 20, not only in that regard, but they are also supposed to be spiritually transformed. They are now supposed to live a life that is in complete submission and obedience to God. Why? Because they have gone through the baptism. They have gone through Old Testament baptism. And remember, let me tell you before I go with my debate in the deal. The Old Testament is but a shadow of the New Testament. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? So if you want to understand New Testament, or you want to understand Old Testament, check for how it cross-references the two. So the Old Testament is a shadow. Go Bible school to what I do. So in the Old Testament, they, 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 they have salvation now. They've been brought out of Egypt. And they have been in the camp. And now they're going to fight. They're going to do a battle Monday in, in Joshua chapter 11. They're fighting. And, 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 and Joshua sends men out so that they can go and look. Radha they can go and check out the city. They come back, sister, sister, sister Manas, and they tell Joshua, they men, dead people is weak people. Ah, they tell Joshua, those people are weak. See, you don't need to send everyone. 
Just send 2,000 men, 3,000 men, it's fine. They are supposed to, to win the battle against them. And, and Joshua takes heed to this because now Joshua believes they have the strength, they have the capacity, they have the ability within their camp, and Joshua sends about two, 3,000 people. They get to the camp of the enemy, and when they get in the camp of the enemy, the Bible says the enemy kills them. The enemy overthrows them. The enemy wins the battle, and the enemy puts them to flight. The Bible says, and Joshua on his turn goes back to God, and he asks God, God, how be it that you allow this? You brought us across the river Jordan. You have brought us through the process of deliverance. You have brought us through the process of transformation. You have brought us through the month of May. Are we not supposed to be delivered? Are we not supposed to be healed? Are we not supposed to have miracles? We are losing this battle. God says, whoa, 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 whoa. I have brought you through the month of May. I have brought you through the month of deliverance, healing, and miracles. But is he delivering? You came through Jordan, but there's no residue. I'm still finding residue of unrighteousness amongst you. He's saying to them, yes, I've brought you through Jordan. I've brought you through the transformation process. But how be it that I still find residue of unrighteousness within you? He says, and for this reason, I have decided to retract my hand from you. I'm not helping you. Because I have commanded you to let go of the things where I'm bringing you out of. And you decided you're going to come through this, through this process and you're still going to carry the baggage that I wanted to transform you from. You decided you're going to hold on to that unrighteousness. You decided you're going to hold on to that thought pattern. You decided you're going to hold on to that struggle even though I created a window. Of opportunity for transformation. And so Joshua, I would help my hand. Because amongst you there is someone that broke the agreement. There is someone that neglected the covenant. There is someone that did not want to separate himself from the unrighteousness. So Joshua, what I want you to do, I want you to get at the tribes, Joshua. And then after you get at the tribes, I want you to get at the families, Joshua. Then after you get at the families, I want you to get a family out of the family, Joshua. Then after you have get at the family out of the family, then there will be a man amongst the men. And you will find that person amongst that man. You will find that person that failed to separate himself amongst that men. Joshua, and when you find him, I want you to kill him. And when you kill him, don't just kill him. Kill his children, kill his mother, kill his father, kill his oxen, kill everything that is connected to him because I want the camp to be clean. I, if I'm going to take you into the promise, I need the camp to be clean. I need there to be, I need you to do the right thing if you want to go into prophetic fulfillment. I don't need you to do, I, I say, I say, sister, this, I, I say, I got there, I got there and I saw a beautiful coat. The, the coat was too beautiful. It was too beautiful. And mind you, bro, Christopher, when I lifted up the coat, I found sickles of soul underneath. I found something there. There are some so lacquer. Didn't ease my nerves. This is done what my geleendheid bied om item te gee aan my kwaad. It was nice. He says, no, I, 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 I found a beautiful coat. And underneath that coat, I found silver. And underneath that silver, I found a bar of gold. And I took it. And what I did, I brought it into my tent. As, as, it was not as if you look at uh, as, uh, it's not a whole house. It's, most, it's me. I brought it into my tent. It's, it's, it's not my marriage. 
I brought it into my team. The problem is, the problem is, Sister Cordelia, Tante Cordelia, the whole camp is full. Because it's in your tent. You see, many times, we, 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 we think that what we are doing and what we are committing ourselves to and the agreements and covenants that we are breaking with God, that it only affects us. And we say, it's me doing it. Anyway, it's my relationship with God. I'm going to carry my own baggage one day. And, and say this, Kravani, ya, come on, sa sa eye oorki of, sa eye pakki na di mark drani. The Bible says, and the Lord not only excommunicated this man, but he killed him. He killed his oxen so that there might be no seed of sin within the camp. But we thank God today that, that we don't have that legalistic approach anymore. But Alfonso, the reality is, God's opinion what disobedience has to change. He still feels the same way about it. The only difference is now that we have a mediator that when God wants to kill me for my unrighteousness, then says, then Jesus says, not yet. Not yet. Uh, like that gardener that says, also, oh, we, we're not going to take the tree out just yet. Give me one more year. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work around him, and maybe next year, this time, he might have fruit. And so we have a mediator that stands in between me and the Father and says, "Yes, Alan has committed that sin. He's guilty of treason. He's guilty of iniquity. But Father, give me one more time." And then that same person today. Jesus is standing before the throne of Father. And he's saying, yes, they are guilty. Yeah, no, no, they are guilty. They are guilty of lying. Guilty of cheating. Guilty of disobedience. Guilty of all of those things. Guilty, guilty. They are guilty. The verdict is guilty. But before you announce the sentence, give me one more time with them. Give, give me one service with them. Maybe one time, one gig, let me just get them under one preaching of righteousness and holiness. And maybe, just maybe, they will repent from their iniquities. And maybe, just maybe, there will be a turnaround. And, and just maybe you don't have to kill them. And so the mediator, the advocate, your lawyer, Jesus Christ, he stands in the courtroom of heaven. And Jesus being the judge, is defending your case. And he's asking you, what do you plead? What do you plead? Now, 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 to sit here and say, I'm innocent, will not make you someone worthy of grace. No, no, I'm innocent. I've done nothing. There's nothing in my life. I'm perfect. I'm alright with God. It will not make you worthy of grace. But, 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 therefore, there's no condemnation. For them that are in Christ, but but if you read further, did you read further? Did you read further? Read further. As you met me. So, 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 what makes me worthy of grace is when I can say I'm a sinner. I'm guilty. I'm guilty of whatever has been brought against me. But I accept the grace this morning. As I go through this process of transfiguration, I'm willing to let go of what I shouldn't be. God says, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm retracting my hands from you because you did not bring your end to the bargain. And I'm wondering this morning, under the unction of God, what Holy Spirit said to me, what is the tent? The first thing that we have to understand is that we cannot clean our homes if we don't clean our hearts. You cannot clean your home, you cannot clean your marriage, you cannot clean your children unless you clean yourself first. Ne? Die oude mense wat gesê het, ek weet nie of ek het nou rekord sê nie, niks vies nie skoon soos een nieuwe biesel nie. So you need to become a new broom first. You need to become a new broom first. And I'm wondering if there's people here this morning that can say with me, I'm guilty. 
I'm saying, God, that if you're going to use me to clean anything, clean me first. Take the stings of unrighteousness out of me. Take the residue of sin out of me. If you're going to use anybody, I want you to use me. I said, yes, but use me. But if you're going to use me, clean me first. Redeem me first. So that when I go home this afternoon and I find anything in my house that contradicts the agreement that I made with you, I'm taking it out. I'm removing it. I in the kamer, I haal it out the kamer. Die, 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 die wijn in die ijskas, ek haal het uit. Die, die, die sigaretts onder die bed, ek haal het uit. Ek gee nie om of het myne is of nie myne is nie. Maar aan die huis het, I made a decision. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That secular music, it stops today. Nobody is playing secular music because I'm cleaning the camp. And I've availed myself that God would clean me so that I can start cleaning the camp. If there's anyone like that this morning, you can stand to your feet. I'm cleaning the camp. Because I want to be used by God. Uh, I don't care who judges me after this. I don't care who has an opinion of me after this. I want to be used by God. I want to be transformed. And so this morning, I stand before the throne of grace with boldness, knowing that I will obtain mercy and grace to be out at the right time. And I stand before God and I ask for forgiveness. And so in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to ask you right where you're standing to open your mouth and ask God for whatever it is that he needs to take out of your life, that he takes it out. I want you to talk to God. If you are standing, talk to God. I want you to begin to talk to whatever it is. You know, he knows. Talk to God. Talk to God. Tell him to take it out of you. If it's doubt, tell him to take it out of you. Because even doubt is a sin. If it's fear, ask him to take it out of you. Whatever it is, I'm making room for God this morning. I'm, he, he's moving it over. He's moving that behaviorism over. He's moving that attitude over. He's moving it over. Whatever it is, ask him to move it out of your life. Give that thing an eviction notice. Let it go. Father, purify my heart. I twist the truth. Take it out of me today. Take it out of me today. Take it out of me. Cleanse my camp. Cleanse my camp. Clean my camp. Everything and anything. I recognize the grace of God this morning. I take hold of that grace, Father, and I thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Then, from my wife to my children, to my mother, my mother-in-law, my family members that's here, each and everyone in the house, the body of Christ at large, those online, I want to apologize this morning. And I want to ask for your forgiveness if I have failed you in any way disappointed you in any way, if I offended you in any way, if I did anything that caused you to stumble. The Bible says, via home, via vidi, strekel, blokom. 
So I ask you for forgiveness this morning. I plead that you would forgive me and that you would grant me the opportunity to go at it again. Bless the name of the Lord. If I neglected a promise that I've made to you, I stand before you humbly this morning and I ask for your forgiveness. I beckon you to forgive me so that God can trust me with greater and more to my wife. Forgive me if I've ever failed you in any way that I have failed you. I plead for your forgiveness this morning. My mom, my school and mom, my family, once again, please do forgive me. I pray that you would forgive me and that you would grant me the opportunity to go at it again. Because many a times we think that we have asked forgiveness before God. Forgive me, forgive me as I forgive those. And if they don't forgive me, then God won't anyway forgive them. Um, so, But I'm asking you for forgiveness. And I want to encourage you this morning, if you need to ask anybody for forgiveness, and if that person is in the sanctuary, you can do it here. You can go home. You can contact whoever you need to ask for forgiveness. But cleanse your camp. Clean your camp. Separate yourself from soul ties. Separate yourself from agreement. Separate yourself from curses. The Bible says a flux on the earth, like a curse without cause, will not come to pass. But lest you repent, you will give that curse cause. Amen. And so this morning I want to ask if there's anybody that wants to give their life to Jesus. You came in here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You recognize the window of opportunity. You see Jesus as your advocate this morning. And you want to be washed by the blood of the Lamb. And you are saying that you want to come today. Please raise your hand right where you are. You want to give your life to Jesus. You want to come out of sin and unrighteousness. And you want to come into the promise of God concerning your life. You can raise your hand right where you are. Is there a hand this morning? Is there someone that's saying, I want to come to Jesus? I want to surrender my life. I don't want to leave this place the same. I want to be transformed, renewed, and changed. I want God to set me free from the bondage and slavery of sin. If there's no one, can we raise our hands? If you are seated, would you please stand as we pray together?